All right, so it says here 8.1, if CD is the altitude of triangle ABC, meaning it makes a right angle, okay, and it goes from a vertex down, then we're going to get a set of triangles. How many triangles do you see in this picture? Two. Two? Three. Three? Okay. Two. Well, let's see here. There's triangle ABC. That's one. There's triangle ADC. That's two. And then there's triangle BDC. That's three. Now, here's the thing I want to point out to you. If I mark this angle, I'm going to give it a Greek letter. So I'm going to call that Greek letter theta. Okay. It's kind of like X's and Y's and Z's. It's just a variable representing just a general angle. Okay. Then here's what I know. If that's theta, then we know that theta plus this other angle should add up to 90 degrees. Right? We know that much. I'm going to need name this angle as well. Let's call this angle um, phi. It looks like a circle with a line down the middle of it, straight down. So it's kind of like theta, only turned the other way. So theta, phi. We use these quite a bit. They just represent variables when you're talking about angles. So you'll see them quite often. So instead of x's and y's and z's, you might see thetas and phi's to represent unknown angles. We know that theta and phi should add up to 90 degrees. OK, that's fine. Now, here's my next question. Look at this triangle right here, BDC. And if this is theta, well, let's use numbers for you folks. Let's say this is 30 degrees. That would mean that phi is 60 degrees. You OK with those numbers, 30 and 60? OK. If this is 30 degrees, how much is angle BCD? How much would that angle right there be? If this is 30, that's a 90. What's this? This would also be 60 degrees. So it's going to be the same as that angle down there. So based on the picture, we should see that all three of these triangles have congruent angles. So we can now say, what about these three triangles? They are similar to each other. And if they're similar, then what's the magic word? They're all proportional, so we can make ratios of their sides and set them equal. And that, guys, literally is the entire lesson pretty much in, in its entirety. We just have to flesh it out. So let's move quickly before we get too bored. So the theorem says, hey, if you have the situation, you have three triangles that are similar. So now we need to name them. So triangle ABC is similar to triangle. Let's make sure we name them in the right order. ABC, that's on the big triangle, is similar to triangle C, uh, CBD which is similar to triangle mm, ACD. Okay, so not that big of a deal. Now, what happens when we set up these proportions, gang, is you're going to see this strange phenomenon where we're using the same length in both sides of the proportion. And the reason being is because you notice this altitude right here. Can you see that it's the long leg of this small triangle? Can you see that CD is the long leg? Can you see it's also the short leg of this medium-sized triangle? You see that? So it's getting used for both triangles. So if we made a proportion between those two triangles, we would see that length show up twice. This is called the geometric mean. This is one of the harder concepts to make sense of. So just be aware. The, the idea of geometric mean throws people off every single year. And every year we try to refine it, and every year we're still thrown off. So pay attention, make sense of it. <coughs> so here's how you solve for the geometric mean of two numbers. You would write those two numbers as a over x is equal to x over b. So this is me trying to find the geometric mean between two numbers a and b. So how you solve this? Well, you cross multiply, and you take the square root. Okay, that's how you find the geometric mean of two numbers. It's just one more algebra formula for you. The question is, where does it come from? Why do we call it the geometric mean? Well, another type of mean that you've heard about is the arithmetic mean. Yeah. Okay, that's also known as the average. Yeah. So how do you find the average of two numbers, guys? Yeah. Okay, so add the two numbers and then divide by how many numbers you got, which is two? Yeah. Okay, so let's just try that out. Just kind of recall the arithmetic mean, though. So if you use the numbers two and eight. If you add them up, you get 10. You divide them by 2, what do you get? Five. <coughs> 5. OK, so 5. I guess you could say 5 is kind of measure of center. It's like the center between these two numbers, isn't it? So it's a measure of center. And here's th how it's a measure of center. If you notice, the distance between 2 and 5 is how much? Three. And between eight, 5 and 8, how far is it? Three. Right, the distance is 3. So you could say that this is the additive center of 2 and 8. 5 is the additive center. If I had to add, I had to add the same amount or subtract the same amount to get to this number. The dead center between them that way. 
the geometric mean, instead of being the additive center, is going to be the multiplicative center. You're like, what does that even mean? Well, here's what it means. Again, let's use our numbers, 2 and 8. And let's find the geometric mean between 2 and 8. So we're going to use this uh, formula right here. We're going to say 2 is to x as x is to 8. And now we're going to cross multiply. When we do so, we end up with x squared equals 16. Therefore, x must equal 4. And you'd say plus or minus 4. But the context here, we're looking for a number between these two positive numbers. So it must be positive 4. We're OK with that? So the geometric mean between 2 and 8 is 4. Not 5 this time, it's 4. So there's 2, uh, let's see here, there's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, there's 8. So here, here's where the geometric mean occurs, is at 4. You're like, but that's not even in the center. How is that a measure of center? Well, here's my question to you folks. What do I have to multiply 2 by to get to 4? So multiplicatively, it takes a multiplier of 2 to get to 4. What do you have to multiply 4 by to get to 8? So it's kind of like the same thing with multiplication. Yeah, so it is a center. It is a measure of center, isn't it? It's the multiplicative center as opposed to the additive center. Okay, is that sitting well with us? Yeah. Ma'am. The arithmetic mean? So it says take your numbers, add them, and then divide by 2. This will then find the value that is halfway between both of those quantities. But you're wondering why that's the case? Yes, so here, whereas I'm adding two things and then dividing, mm -hmm. down here I'm multiplying two things and then taking the square root. So it does feel kind of like it's like a parallel type of operation going on but with higher powered things, right? Multiplication is much more powerful than addition. And taking the square root is much more powerful in terms of what it does to your numbers than dividing by something. Okay, depending on what you're dividing by, I suppose. So what does this mean to you? Ultimately, if I ask you to find the geometric mean of two numbers, you're just using this formula. In fact, I'm seeing you guys starting to wane. So if you would, please, would you find the geometric mean of some of these numbers? <coughs> And I'll do one of them with you. Which one would you like me to do? And I'll let you do the rest. Number one? No. You mean number, you mean example two, part A, B, or C? That would be what we're referring to here. Okay, which would you prefer, A, B, or C? Doesn't matter to me. C, fine. The biggest numbers? I see what you're up to. <laughs> okay, so 8 over x equals x over 36. Okay, S simple setup, yeah? So now we're going to cross multiply x squared. And I'm not going to multiply those numbers out because I'm cool like that. Why aren't I going to multiply those numbers together? Because you're cool. Yeah, <laughs> stay frosty. So what's the next operation I have to do to get x to solve for x? What's the opposite of squaring something? Uh, you square, root. square root, right? So that's the inverse operation. We have to take the square root of both sides. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So look, I'm going to need to take the square root of that means I'm going to have to simplify this. What's the square root of 36? Six. So that's a perfect square. Hence the reason I didn't want to multiply them together. I already knew there was a perfect square waiting for me to take the square root of. So I was planning ahead. So do the same thing. So I can simplify this. This now becomes x is equal to 6 times the square root of 8. However, we know that 8 can also be simplified, right? So, yep, we're doing letter C. That is correct. Uh, we will get 6 times 4 times 2. And 4 is a perfect square. That comes outside. So we're going to get x equals 6 times 2 times the square root of 2. And that means that x equals 12 times the square root of 2. There's your answer. Did you have to do all those steps? Um, some people would have seen right away um, that you had 36 and 8. You could factor this out to 6. And this you could factor a 4 out and got a 2 and got that 12. You, they could, some people would go right to here, me being one of those people, because I've been doing this just so long. Once you get some practice gain, you'll start being able to see, oh, there's a perfect square there I can factor out. All right, I'm going to give you, th let's go three minutes. Knock out those two problems, please. <laughs>